Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to this eCademy webinar from the Council of State Governments and presented by the Education and Workforce Development Committee of CSG West. Um, glad you all could join us. I think we have an interesting uh, webinar lined up. My name is Jeff Miller, and I'm a policy analyst at CSG West. And uh, uh, we had uh, scheduled to have an introduction from my committee chair, but she is unable to join us at the last minute. But um, we'll, we'll move ahead. And uh, so just to kind of uh, remind folks of, of uh, who we are, CSG West is part of the Council of State Governments, which is a national organization uh, of state leaders. Um, most of our members are state legislators and their staff. And uh, so we're going we're gonna to be focusing a lot on state policy today, but we'll also be talking about uh, local uh, local policy as well and, and, and giving you some examples of some uh, interesting things that are happening around the country in terms of competency-based education. And uh, I will uh, allow our speakers to give you a better definition, but competency-based education is essentially uh, a system where students are uh, supported and encouraged to move through their schooling uh, based on their own strengths and abilities uh, rather than being sort of uh, forced to kind of fall into line uh, based on their age and uh, seat time requirements. So uh, with that being said, I'll jump quickly to the uh, speakers. I think I'm, I'm going to allow them to give you a little more information about themselves, but I will tell you who we have with us. Uh, we're going to be kicking off with Susan Patrick, who is President and CEO of the International Association for Online K-12 Learning, also known as INACOL. Uh, Susan will be followed by Kelly Brady, who is the Director of Mastery Education at the Idaho Department of Education, State Department of Education. And we'll wrap it up with Virgil Hammonds, who is the Chief Learning Office, Officer at KnowledgeWorks. And uh, these folks uh, um, have some great experience nationally with competency-based education. And uh, Kelly Brady is going to give us uh, kind of an overview of what's happening in Idaho from the state level perspective as Idaho is ramping up its mastery education program. So with that, I will turn it over to Susan. Thank you, Jeff, and thanks for hosting me. I'm going to kick it off with a national perspective. There has been significant activity in state policy in education to facilitate this shift from um, just Focusing on the amount of time a student um, sits in a particular class to actually measuring uh, the amount of mastery that a student has in a subject. So it's a pretty straightforward concept um, when you get into I'm going to talk a little bit about what is competency-based education um, and, and share uh, some ideas of what the developments are and the trends are around the country. Next slide, please. So we're in a historic moment for K-12 education policy at large in the United States. On December 10th in 2015, uh, a bipartisan bill went through Congress and was signed by the President. It really unfroze the federal rules related to elementary and secondary education. So the Every Student Succeeds Act shifts the power back to states um, and local communities. That means that states have a rare opportunity right now in the next 12 to 18 months to engage in conversations with their communities to help set new definitions for what student success looks like. Next slide, please. This means we can ask questions with our communities, with workforce, with our education leaders, with teachers, with parents. What do we want a high school graduate to know and be able to do? This is a local question, and one that we can design the system around. We're thinking now about how do we design a system for success for every child. We need to ask ourselves tough questions. Why is it that in today's traditional system we have ninth graders coming in at a fourth grade reading level, a fifth grade math level, or at a sixth grade level, or sometimes at a higher level? And we have one teacher with a single textbook that is trying to differentiate instruction to meet the needs of all students. 
But how do we ensure that every student is moving along based on demonstrating mastery so they don't have those huge gaps? Next slide, please. So the focus then is on competency-based education. And this is a definition um, that Chris Sturgis and I developed in partnership with 100 leaders in the field. The key or core idea is that students advance once they demonstrate mastery on a lesson. Competencies include these very specific learning objectives that, and that they empower students. Students say, this is my learning goal for today. Here's how I'm going to work on it. This is the book that I'm going to read, and here is how I'm going to show it. So assessment then becomes a meaningful learning experience for the student. A teacher might say, OK, you're, trying, you're ready for your assessment, and you describe this concept to me. And a student might get four out of five competencies in, in the lesson, but miss the last one. So try it again. Go back, try it again until you achieve success. And that means that students are getting immediate feedback and support based on their own learning needs. Learning outcomes are, are held high for all students, but they also emphasize competencies like communication, problem solving, teamwork, the application and creation of knowledge, not um, along with the development of these skills and dispositions. So next slide, that gives you a broad-based understanding of what competency-based education is. And just looking back over the last few years, in 2012, there were about a handful of states that were moving um, to better develop their state policy to support competency-based pathways for students. And that provide means they might have some waivers of flexibility from seat time. Um, and then a few st states really working on advanced policy. Next slide. You're going to see a comparison in the color difference between 2016 and 2012. Now we have more than 40 states that are working on emerging policies and advancing policies. There are just a handful of states here that still um, have very restrictive seat time policies. And what this means is that learning can be more focused around the pathway for the learner. That means the learner can learn any time, any place. If they develop those competencies inside of school and outside of school, they can come back to school and earn credit when they demonstrate mastery. So let's move to the next slide. What does this actually look like in the classroom? It means that across the K through 12 continuum to high school graduation, every student has a personalized learning map. Students and teachers know where every student is every day because they've demonstrated that mastery and have evidence of it. It's much more transparent on the level of progress and how far along each student is. This allows students to collaborate with each other on lessons that they know other students have already, have already mastered. So there's a lot of teamwork and collaboration. Um, they're really clear rubrics for the teachers. So the, Students may show mastery in different ways that all students are held to the high, highest uh, level of proficiency and mastery. We're not letting kids go through with big gaps and that students have that evidence. Teachers' professional judgment and calibration is a really important part of the system on assessing that mastery. So you have adults shifting roles. There may be teachers that specialize in in areas of reading that can come in and help pinpoint and target those students' needs. Coaching towards reaching, reaching these goals. Grouping and regrouping in small groups for students. So it includes classroom learning, blended and online learning, and expanded learning opportunities through internships when students are in high school, um, through learning through museums, projects, even over summer um, experiences. So it really opens up and blends formal and informal learning, all focused on students developing mastery. Next slide, please. And so here's an example of a group of students working on their math standards, on their science standards, studying alternative energy, because that is a subject that they're passionate about and interested about. You may have other students in small groups that are interested in other areas. So Thinking about what we want our students to know and be able to do 
and giving them the opportunities and pathways to build those competencies of academic knowledge and skills, but also the important skills they're going to need to be successful in career and in life. Next slide, please. So um, Kelly is with us today from the state of Idaho that's taken on a comprehensive approach for state policy to support local schools and local districts in moving in this direction. At the federal level, we have in the new Every Student Succeeds Act a specific provision in Title I to allow for new innovative assessment and accountability models. Title IV has $1.6 billion of funding that's consolidated across 50 prior programs. That funding has flexibility to use for personalized learning, for competency-based learning, to help provide the technology and systems. Um, competency-based education and personalized learning are included in some of the federal grant um, programs. And there's a federal policy focus that's shifting on higher ed competency-based education. At the state level, um, States are getting started by creating innovation zones to allow districts to do interesting things inside and outside of school on competency-based learning. Um, it's being part of expanded learning opportunities policy, being integrated into the education code comprehensively in Vermont and New Hampshire, Iowa, um, Idaho, Oregon has supported pilots of groups of districts working together. Um, to build knowledge, to build those skills, to be able to manage competency-based learning environments. And proficiency-based diplomas are in place in Maine. Um, they're moving there in New Hampshire, Colorado, Arizona has a Grand Canyon diploma. So the thing are different options for students to have diplomas that show the whole range of academic knowledge and competencies. Next slide, please. And I'm just going to wrap up with one example, uh, several years ago um, in the Iowa legislature, they established a competency-based education task force to examine the issue. They studied um, competency-based learning and created a series of recommendations um, that resulted in some smaller pieces of legislation to remove barriers. Um, they worked with practitioners across the state in districts that were ready to start moving. Um, on redefining the Carnegie unit just in terms of the number of minutes a student's been exposed to a certain subject into the actual competencies that make up the course. Um, and they're working with 10 districts on a pilot to help build educator capacity for the transition to a competency-based system. Next slide. So then competency-based learning is really fundamental to personalize learning at scale, ensuring every student has mastery of the knowledge and skills they need to be successful. And it also challenges almost all of our assumptions about the present system. And my last slide is just on our website. We have um, competencyworks.org is an initiative um, where we have free resources, reports, several reports focused on state policy. Um, we're, we're here to help. And, um, thrilled to be able to turn the presentation over to Kelly Brady from the state of Iowa, who is uh, doing amazing work with a comprehensive approach across the state. And then we'll hear from Virgil Hammonds, who served as a former superintendent in Maine, managing a competency-based, running competency-based district, and was also a principal. So you'll hear the state and the uh, local perspective as well. Thank you. Uh, and Kelly, before you begin, this is Jeff from CSG West. Sorry to cut in, but uh, I forgot to mention a few things at the beginning uh, that I want to make sure everybody is aware of. Uh, you can submit questions at any time to the panelists uh, using the, uh, the little box on the right of your screen. So please feel free to do that, and we'll get to those when we get to the, uh, the end of the, uh, the presentation. Uh, and also just wanted to mention that the, uh, this webinar will be archived. Uh, on the CSG website. Uh, it'll take a few days to get there, but if you go to the CSG website, you'll be able to find it later in case you missed part of it or just want to refer back to some of the uh, some of the information that's been presented. Um, so with that, uh, sorry to interrupt, Kelly. I'll hand it over to you. 
Well, good afternoon. I'm Kelly, and um, it's an exciting time in education in Idaho. Um, I want, I'm going to be talking to you about um, where this idea started in Idaho, and then our journey as of to date and what's going on. So next slide. So in 2013, our Governor Otter commissioned a task force for improving education. 30 members representing a diverse array of organizations, three subcommittees, and 20 recommendations. Um, this is what came out of that task force. So their goal was that we would have 60% of Idahoans that would um, attain a post-secondary degree or credentials by year 2020. And so as they were discussing um, how to make this happen, like I said, the number one recommendation was to move towards a mastery-based education um, learning system. Next slide, please. And so these were the recommendations that came from that task force dealing with mastery education. So they wanted um, the state to shift to a system where students advanced based on, upon content rather than seat time. Um, they wanted mastery should be measured against high academic standards. And, um, and you can see the rest, more personalized learning. One of the things I talked about was having more one-to-one -one technology in the classrooms, understanding the importance of the technology, not replacing the teachers. Um, and at the state level, one of our, one, something that's very important to us is that um, this is really giving the control, local control, to the different districts and schools. So if they see that their um, community supports the one-to-one -one device, then that's absolutely what we're going to help them support. Next slide, please. So from the task force recommendations, um, House Bill 110, so our legislators really supported um, the, the task force recommendations. And so House Bill 110 um, was presented. And this was moving towards a mastery-based model of education where students progress as they demonstrate mastery of subject or grade level um, is the best interest of that Idaho students. And you can see that we really did look at, um, or the state really looked at the definition that um, Susan talked about earlier. And um, this is in our legislation. So in it's in Idaho code, so we know that this is um, the direction that we're going to be taking. Next slide, please. Also in legislation, um, we have there's a, our strategy is, and the state department is um, running this strategy, and it's in code once again. So we are conducting a statewide awareness campaign establish a committee of educators, and facilitate the planning and development of an incubated process. And so these are the three things that, as a State Department, and my job is um, to conduct these things. Next slide, please. So we'll start with the awareness campaign. And I started this job in October and hit the ground running. So um, I followed Superintendent Ybarra around the state to six different regions. And we talked about what is mastery education. Um, we wanted, as we were talking, we were communicating with educators. We were communicating with um, our leaders in the districts, um, just about what was, what was our direction, what were we moving towards, and what were we going to do. Next slide, please. This summer, before I took this job, there was a committee put together to really look at mastery education. And this committee consisted of 18 members from each region. So we have six regions in Idaho. And three people from each region were on this committee. We wanted the committee to be represented by, um, by large districts, small districts, the urban, the rural districts. Um, there were superintendents, um, administrators, teachers, um, education directors, um, curriculum specialists, 
both teachers, elementary and secondary, on various subjects from third grade, ELL, ELA, math, and science. Next slide, please. And that committee looked at um, different roadblocks and what would what changes did we need to make in Idaho, both policy at the state level and at the local level. And so then as I came on in October, one of the things was to build this network incubator of schools and districts to really look at mastery education. And so um, we wanted to districts and schools to have the opportunity to um, to see those roadblocks and really um, immerse themselves in the roadblocks and the successes that were going to happen. So the IM project, or the Idaho Mastery Network, we're looking for, um, this will give schools and districts the opportunity to uh, try out some of these models. Um, we will be looking at the factors that are necessary for success and implementation. Um, and we're in the process right now, so on Friday, they have already looked at the, we've already looked at the applications and had those scores, and we will be announcing who will be in the network then. So the network, the schools that applied, we have um, a school that has 11 students that applied for this to be in this network. We have a school that has 15,000 students that applied. We have both rural, rural and urban. We have charter schools, alternative schools, and public schools. Um, we have a number of schools that are at very different developmental points. We have um, five different regions in Idaho represented. Um, and then we have both individual schools and whole district um, schools that wanted to um, participate. Our theory in this process was that um, just as we meet students who come to us where they are, we want to meet the districts and schools, including our charter schools, where they are, and then build their capacity to um, really make this successful. Next slide, please. So the network, our principal goals are, we have three of them. So the first one is commitment. Commitment. We want the initial cohort of approved applicants will form this Idaho Mastery Education Network. The formation of this network will demonstrate to the State Department the commitment to provide training, um, professional expertise, technical assistance, and policy support. And participation in the network will help to increase statewide understanding of mastery learning by serving as critical proof points. We want our uh, members to be innovative, so mastery-based learning is um, it's local and a school-level initiative. So as they're being innovative, to really know that they have control and um, that they're supporting their community. The network participants will be supported to innovate programs that will be customized. Um, participation in the network will give members the opportunity to collaborate, develop, innovative design competent <coughs> components such as competencies, assessments, and performance metrics. Um, and that's something that we are going to be discussing at the state level. They want our state support. Um, just because we do have some of, like I mentioned before, we have a district that has 11 students, and so we really do want to be here to help support them. But we also want um, the flexibility. We want the network members will play a critical role in determining what, if any, state or local policy flexibility may be needed, as well as developing and piloting solutions. Next slide, slide please. So this was our timeline. So in December, we, um, we had anybody who put out a press release, anybody who would like to apply to be part of this network. Um, we ask them to fill out an intent letter and a readiness survey. And then in February, we started the technical assistance for the applicants, and we posted the application and encouraged them to apply. 
We had a very quick turnaround. We gave them about a month to complete the application. And um, the applications were due the middle of May. And then um, we had a group of 23 reviewers, both nationally and locally, who looked at the applications and scored the applications with a rubric. And if you would like to look at our application, I left it posted um, on our website so that you're welcome to look at that and see the direction that we went. Um, in, and then it's April now. And so we will be selecting. We've looked at the scores that the applicants or the reviewers gave to each applicant with um, suggestions or comments that they had. We ranked those applicants and um, we'll be announcing the cohort or the IM on Friday. Um, and then in July and August will be um, the implementation will begin. So we'll have a kickoff meeting in June and then in July I hope to take a team to New Hampshire. They have a um, competency design school there, so um, I'll be taking a team there just to get that initial help and support that they might need. Next slide, please. Oh, there's one slide missing, which was common themes. Um, so I'll just talk real quickly about these. So there was a slide in there that wasn't there. It's common themes. So some of the things that we saw in the applications that came in, um, after reading them, we saw that many of the applicants um, were really concerned about de developing their competencies um, and then also developing the rubrics and proficiency skills and assessments to go with those competencies. Um, some of the districts felt that they needed to identify um, a learning management system right away. Um, and that was an issue for, for all of them. Um, and then a huge piece of it was the higher education outreach. Many of the applicants felt compelled by higher education admissions requirements to either stay with traditional letter grades or grade point averages and report cards or crosswalk them behind the scenes. And so they were concerned that if they moved in this direction or how were they going to move in this direction so that um, they had the support from higher education. And then also a piece that we looked at was they were struggling with that alignment um, and incorporation of state and local, or excuse me, state and federal programs. Um, most of the responses didn't know exactly how they were going to incorporate those um, policies into their plans. Um, so we will be, as a state, we are here to support this um, move towards mastery education in, in our schools. Hopefully with this um, network we'll be able then to um, scale it across Idaho and have some recommendations for schools that want to work towards this work toward this direction. So um, with that I want to thank you for hearing about um, Idaho's journey. All right. Thank you, Kelly. This is Jeff Miller again from CSG West. Uh, and uh, uh, the next speaker is uh, Virgil Hammonds with KnowledgeWorks. And Virgil, maybe when you, uh, before you start, you can tell us a little bit about KnowledgeWorks and um, also what a chief learning officer does. Thanks, Jeff. And I'm still learning what a chief learning officer does. <laughs> All kidding aside, though, um, I essentially what I do is I, I support state entities and local school districts in making the um, as the title says, localizing the vision for personalized competency-based learning, and, and how, do, how do we take that policy and that vision and make that a reality? Um, I've had a real pleasure um, prior to serving at KnowledgeWorks of working with some amazing educators and innovators um, across the country. Um, as, a, as a high school principal in Lindsay, California, uh, we were the first um, comprehensive public K-12 or 
high school or K-12 system and high school to fully convert to a competency-based system where it was where kids moved entirely based on mastery um, and proof of competency rather than on, on seed time and, and um, that was in Central California. That, uh, that role allowed me to um, tour the country and talk about high school redesign and um, how to support that and thinking of all of the factors that Susan and Kelly have outlined that uh, certainly need to be um, uh, configured and figured out in respect to um, how do we make competency and personalized learning or real in, in any size high school in any neighborhood. And um, that led to me transitioning to the superintendency in Maine. And uh, the school district um, I served was the first to fully convert to a, um, a, a K-12 competency-based personalized learning um, infrastructure that helped guide the policy design in Maine, which I'll talk about here shortly. And in respect to KnowledgeWorks, um, KnowledgeWorks supports um, states um, and works in collaboration with, with state departments and organizations like INACL and Susan and others in helping make this real and how do we do this in partnership with one another. Um, everything from the policy design to the community engagement processes to uh, the design of competencies and that learning continuum and um, the community support for, for making that vision possible. You don't mind passing forward? Next slide. So what we talk a lot about with, with communities are what, what if we take the very best of what we do in our learning communities and lift that in supporting every, every one of our kids. And a big piece that um, I'm, I and the organization are entirely passionate about is when, when we go to school systems or we go to state departments, we talk about this not being a lift for, for our most, um, what are typically Kids, those that um, are doing extremely well in school and are looking to accelerate the uh, opportunities for themselves. We talk about what if we took everything that we did really well and supported the lift of every child, and then how do we make that possible um, throughout a learning community? You can pass forward, please. Sorry, these are all animated. If you can click through to the very end there. So. We oftentimes, as communities, um, speak a lot about um, how do we transform our school district into a learning community. Um, and so how do we ensure that what we are doing is supporting this new world that we live in? Um, our kids are so, so used to accessing information at the tip of our fingers every single moment of our lives. So how do we leverage um, how we work and how we socialize to help drive what we learn? Um, the big examples that we speak to, if, if we are going to drive to competency and personalized learning, as you heard from Susan and Kelly, um, that is a, a, a gigantic um, movement that cannot strictly happen for, um, on those broad, amazing shoulders of our educators. So how do we lift what's happening in the community to help drive learning anywhere and anytime and from anybody? So imagine you have, you have kiddos that are um, involved in Boy Scouts or Girl Scouts or accessing learning opportunities at, at Boys and Girls Clubs after school and on the weekend um, or while they are on vacation with their families or out to eat um, or simply um, doing whatever activity that they're in um, that they love as, as simply as uh, riding a bike or playing with friends can we teach them and help them to understand um, them being kids understand how what they do is applicable to um, what they have learned in class and equally important can we work in partnership with our um, community partners and helping them to understand what those expectations are for for all kids and how they can be a part of the of the learning solution if you don't mind clicking forward please so to do that um, we often talk about the second order changes that need to happen to make that possible but also the the sec how we lead beyond those those second order changes and how we help kids and our communities to think about how they um, can help drive these second order changes. And um, this slide essentially speaks to um, how we subtly tweak some pieces to make this, this vision a reality. Um, if you don't mind passing forward. Actually, stay, if you can go back to that slide one more time, sorry about that. I just want to hit on one, the last bullet. Um, define success in terms of strategic alignment and results. Um, so. I want to hit on that one a little bit just because uh, when you talk about or when we talk about competency education and personalized learning, 
this isn't just something that you do on top of everything else. What we're talking about here is complete systems redesign. So how do you create a, an aligned set of structures that support this and making this possible? Because if we're talking about adding competency on top of this initiative and that initiative, um, it doesn't become systemic. And so when we, and I reference that because again, we're not talking about some kids or a group of kids, we're talking about all children. Thanks, so, so what do we need to, to, um, to put those pieces in place? If you can, there you go. District, so the district conditions, um, we often speak to uh, what are those district conditions that we need to ensure that kids are, are given the opportunity to, to personalize learning and uh, much like what, um, uh, what Susan and Kelly have done is KnowledgeWorks has engaged uh, thought partners across the country to talk about what are those conditions um, to, to make this vision possible um, and how did they go about doing that. And on our website, um, and I, I'll, Jeff, I'll share you, with you the link to send out to everyone that is participating in the webinar, um, we have access to, uh, we provide access to those 10 district conditions for scaling personalized learning and also the state policy framework that is tied to those 10 district conditions. And in our role now, we, we speak with school systems across the country and saying, where are you in respect to these 10 district conditions? What are pieces that you have put in place in terms of curriculum or assessment or community or transparency? And how do we, how do we help um, support your, your evolution? So much like what um, we help um, classroom teachers do in personalizing learning, we want to do the same with, with the learning communities we serve. So where are you now in respect to um, implement or systematizing personalized learning and competency ed? And then how do we help you grow uh, through the next step? If you don't mind continuing on. So the big question that always comes up, and Kelly referenced it in her presentation, is what, geez, what does a competency look like? And, and how do you design that? And so this is an example of a competency that's, that's widely used um, throughout New England. I, I live in Maine. I, again, I serve a school district in Maine that, uh, that, did, did, this, that did do this pre-K through 12 um, and also partnered with um, colleges to create this um, um, well-aligned system pre-K through 14. So when our kiddos graduated or advanced through our continuum and wanted to continue to advance their learning despite still being in high school um, or in some cases middle school, um, because there was a direct alignment between the, the school district, the learning community, and, and the college, um, it was very easy to transition, at least academically. So Kelly and Susan did reference this. What is, a measure, what, is a, what is a, what we call measurement topic, but a competency look like? And then how do you define that? Because oftentimes, as, as I travel across the country, the, the concern that comes up is, geez, personalized learning seems kind of fluffy and, and not as organized as it should be. And, do kids get to dictate what they're what they're doing on their own, and and how does a teacher measure when a, when a student has has truly learned um, and produced something at an appropriate level? And my answer back to that is, well, there's a framework and a structure that certainly needs to be in place. But the other the other key piece is how do we help kids to understand when they reach um, competency and how they can drive their own personal learning. Um, so what you have here in front of you is an example of a measurement topic, and I'm going to just try to quickly go through it because I know we want to have time for some questions. Um, so what you're looking at is the competency is the level three knowledge, which is you see on the left. Um, within that level three knowledge, you see three different learning targets that, the, that each child will be held accountable to. That is the competency level. In the middle column, you see taxonomy level, and that's the rigor point. So when we talk about personalized learning, off, the, again, the biggest concern is, geez, uh, do, do kids just get to pick whatever they want to learn at whatever level? How, do we, how are we ensuring rigor and the appropriate depth of knowledge? And then how do we scaffold that? So we do that by identifying, by identifying the appropriate rigor point. In this case, it's at the comprehension level under symbolizing. And to the right are examples of what, what that could look like in re reference to learning opportunities or assessments. The level two knowledge, which you see um, down below, is, is the basic terms and details. And oftentimes as an educator, as a former teacher, I would count that vocabulary test as, as just as um, a meaningful part of evidence of learning as as um, the final uh, the final product. When really that those basic terms, details, dates, names help help are just the foundation for helping them the child to achieve competency. So so we identify that, and you can see underneath that um, the the competency level, the taxonomy level of that retrieval. 
Um, so it's a lower depth of knowledge. And just a child being able to retrieve and recall that information is not as important as them um, understanding and understanding how, how this applies to what they're doing next. So we want to be crystal clear in, in what those expectations are. We want to help kids in helping them to understand how, how competencies are scaffolded and how they scale. And equally important, we want them to understand how, how they can take the competency and make it meaningful in their world. Which brings me to the next slide. So a big part that we, we support school systems with is that uh, understand what, understanding what taxonomy levels are. And so we do this with kids. So imagine if we te can teach kids how, um, what the depth of knowledge is that we want them to accomplish that competency at. And we also empower them to take, take that depth of knowledge and make it relevant in, in, their, in their learning ecosystem. So whether they're an athlete um, participating in a sport and they can apply any content, they still have to prove that they're hitting their appropriate taxonomy level or if they're on vacation, again, or if they're, or they're participating in a club, or in music, or any, any um, area of interest, if they understand the competency, they understand the taxonomy level, then not only is the, is the teacher doing this heavy lift on his or her own, the child is a part of the process and they take ownership, which, which further accelerates learning, which is extremely powerful. Um, the other piece that, um, we support learning communities and, and state entities with is how do we how do we teach our, our community and state partners to understand taxonomy levels, depths of knowledge, and what competency means for kids, and how they are a part of how they can also be a part of helping kids um, reach that competency. You go to the next slide for me, please. So what I have here is um, an example of the strategic strategic plan framework from the state of Maine. And this is when Commissioner Bowen and, um, was in office. And this is shortly after the legislation for the proficiency diploma passed um, in Maine. And Commissioner Bowen at that time, he now works for the Innovation Lab Network for um, the Chief Counsel for School State Officers. He wanted to put a roadmap in place for supporting, much like Kelly and her team have done, wanted to put a roadmap in place so, so the communities the school districts understood what, what it means, and so they put some of these pieces in place. And now, um, uh, if, you, if you look at the titles, you can see that the pieces that I've been speaking to are all pieces that Maine also sees as a systemic reform happening, not in just one or two school districts in Maine, but throughout the entire state. If you don't mind advancing for me, please. So, a big so the the cute dot uh, cute child in the middle that's that's my own daughter and I oftentimes reference uh, my kid um, quite a bit um, because I though I was extremely passionate about personalized learning it didn't make it didn't make sense total sense to me until I had more than one um, child so what who you see here is Maya and Maya is um, um, she's she's eager to please. She wants to learn a lot. She soaks it in. She connect makes connections just naturally without our prodding. Um, um, and everything she does, whether she's playing soccer, or gym, doing gymnastics, or practicing her piano, she makes it. She can she can tie it to um, she can tie it to what she's learning in class. Uh, versus my son Pierce, who's three, um, the complete opposite. Um, for him, it's about he, he has to have the hands-on support. Um, he needs to. Um, he needs different um, strategies and and accommodations to help support his learning. And um, knowing that the funny part is, I as a parent who is just passionate about personalized learning and competency ed, um, I didn't realize just what that meant entirely as a, as a parent until I had my own two kids. And make it, how do we make that real in every school system that that we work with and serve? And knowing that um, the unique needs of every child, even within the same home, is so unique. Um, so to do that, what we talk a lot about is make sure that we're defining and, and we're crystal clear about those competencies we're expecting for kids. Let's help them to personalize it and doing that throughout the community. Let's give them some say in that. So what's that learner agency? How do they do that outside of school? So it's not just on those uh, get miraculous shoulders of, of our educators. And then how do we, what's the social empowerment of, of that? How do we create that culture where, where they're driving to, to doing some greater good, so not just for themselves in personalized learning, but so that they're helping to drive um, the communities in which, they, in which they live. 
if you don't mind advancing. So we, Susan and Kelly have referenced this a lot, so I'm not going to go through these big things, but I, I will just hit um, one of the, two of the key pieces. One, um, learners only move on once they've proven mastery. Again, you've, we've identified the, the competency, we've identified the rigor point, that taxonomy level. Um, instruction is, is, is unique and defined to the unique needs of every kid and the, and the kids before them. And we give them the, the only piece I'll, I'll continue to hit on here is the opportunity to double dip. So getting kids to competency is, is really difficult, right? We're, we're not talking about some competencies, we're talking about all competencies, right? And all children. So how do we give them the opportunity to prove their, their mastery in English and writing while, they're, while they are also doing uh, math or science or music or art? Um, how, is it, how can we help them to, sh to do that? And how do we empower kids to do that? And also how can we help um, educators to see how that is possible? Um, the, other, the other piece, and it's, it's not necessarily on here, but when we talk about competency, one um, piece that we often talk about is it's, it's not about averaging those, those um, competencies to come up with a final score. It really is about ensuring that kids have mastered and learned all of, the, um, all of those standards that we've clearly defined for them. And when you do that, um, that doesn't mean you, you average and that's the hard part with competency, that averaging pieces out. Now it's about helping kids get to the appropriate depth of knowledge with every, with every standard. If you don't mind moving on. Great. So I'll just conclude with this, um, this one piece. Um, and for, forgive me for, being, for, for harping on this and, and being passionate about it, but I, but I truly believe this. Um, if we're going to personalize learning and do it for all kids, then we have to ensure that we're, we're clearly defining what competency is and what that looks like and helping kids to understand that. Because um, if not, um, we're not being equitable in respect to our expectations and supports for all kids. That competency and the appropriate depth of knowledge, that is the equity lever that is necessary to, to help drive personalized learning for all kids and, and, in, and in any neighborhood. Thanks for your time. Appreciate it. All right. Well, thank you. Thank you, Virgil. And thanks to all of the speakers. Uh, just wanted to remind folks, uh, please submit questions if you have any. Uh, you can just type them right in, and, and, and uh, we will pass them on to the uh, presenters. And also, you know, some of the presenters, if you have um, additional information that you thought of while we were, while we were, uh, while someone else was presenting, uh, let us know, and we'll, we'll give you a chance to provide that. Um, I, I have some questions here. Uh, so, are there policies that uh, any? I guess maybe this is for Susan or Virgil, um, but possibly for Kelly as well. Are there policies that you're aware of that kind of make it a little more difficult to implement uh, competency-based education, either at a state level or at a district level? Can you give any examples of policies that kind of make that sort of push against? This, type, this approach to education? Sure. No, that's a great question. In terms of state policy and in thinking about the maps that I showed earlier, we don't need to go back there, but if you think about the policy development um, being much like states developing competency um, to support competency-based education, so there are different levels of policy that really need to synchronize to help support these learner-centered, personalized environments um, where students can, can experience competency-based learning. And I would say um, an example of a state policy that is not as supportive, it doesn't mean that you can't do it, um, is California, which has very strict seat time um, regulations. And what that means is when you when you get started, you can get started with competency-based learning. And, and Virgil was in Lindsay Unified, so he can speak to what that's like to be a, a high school principal. Um, but if you really want to open up the walls between your learning in school and learning in the community, and there's a restriction such as no more than 19% of a student's time can be spent outside of the school walls. And that student wants to do an internship, and that student wants to participate in a 
community play or some other activities where they could be building competencies or writing a play as part of their English language arts standards, um, you start running into the seat time restrictions of, of those rules where um, then the next level up are states that create waivers for seat time. And so um, they say, the state policy will say, okay, you want to restrict, you want a, a waiver from that seat time policy, you have to apply sort of a bureaucratic process for a waiver. And in some states like Michigan, they have waivers, but the schools and the districts have to apply every year for their waiver. So the third level up, where I would say you're getting to more of a proficiency um, model of state policy, is to allow for what's called credit flexibility. And that provides blanket flexibility in state policy to say, you can either define your credits at the time, or you have permission to define them as competencies. And that means that any district or any school that's ready to move towards true personalized learning, true competency-based progression, can move forward without those state policy barriers. And that's really the fourth level of, of advancing competency-based policy is what New Hampshire is well known for, what Maine is well known for, which is to first create that credit flexibility and then work on redefining those Carnegie units in terms of competencies, moving toward a proficiency-based diploma. And there are different schools and different districts in those states at different levels of implementation. But what Idaho has done in creating these pilots to create a different relationship with the state and district, being one of support and empowerment and capacity building for districts to support a, a cycle of continuous improvement and moving towards it rather than just being about compliance, um, that the state's actually taking an active role in supporting innovation to move the competency-based system. That is like an example of the highest level of state policy to help support. So there may be different entry points depending on where a state is, um, but you see the rules start to not only allow for kind of flexibility, but also to be active in helping to support the capacity building at the school and local level. Jeff, if I can give you a principal's version or answer to that question. Sure. So I can recall um, um, a county department of education official coming into my school system and count and saying, sorry, um, you don't have enough minutes of this particular content area's instruction, instruction so you have to adjust your mastery, your master schedule um, to meet the, the seat time requirement. And my response was, well, we're reworking our master schedule um, every, uh, very frequently to meet the needs of the unique needs of each kid. So if a kiddo is doing really well and is advancing in our, in our English continuum, uh, but he needs greater support with math and science, then I'm going to double block him um, in math and science or show how he can prove his math and science um, knowledge in, in other ways. And um, if we're going to keep him to particular seat time requirements, that I'm not meeting his needs. And so we, and again, I'm, I'm getting them to and my team is getting them to competency, not not 51 percent or 61 percent of the knowledge, but truly being masterful in all the content. So we need to be able to be flexible in respect to how we group our kids and what instructional supports they receive um, in and out of school. All right, thanks, Virgil. Uh, this, I guess, this is for anybody. Uh, what does a competency-based approach mean in terms of school staffing? Does it require more teachers, fewer, uh, more support staff, uh, more or fewer administrators? And, and I guess in a related question is, uh, are there implementation costs to school districts? Sure, I can, I can speak to that. Um, having done it at the site level and, and the district level and working with others now, um, so I've, I've worked in school systems where there's um, a great deal of categorical support um, to help to help with learning opportunities, and I've and I've also served in school systems where there's very little 
um, categorical supports or additional fund, federal funding. So we're reliant on our local funding and our state funding. And, and either way, we were able to make it work within the current fiscal infrastructure that existed within that particular learning community. So really, again, I, I would say it, we're not talking about a, a subtle tweak. It's a complete commitment to the um, to first line of learning and competency ed. So um, you take your current, what you have for professional development um, um, investment, and you make the entire commitment to making this vision possible. And and I would say that the feedback I give to cut staff. In fact, it's a it's a greater opportunity to support staff in understanding what they do so well in the classroom. And, and connecting and partnering with, with um, community partners to, um, to support the needs of every child. So um, I think when, when PD is focused and all PD is completely aligned to personalized learning and competency ed and not, um, it's not where school systems run into trouble is when there's a shift every month. And this is very common where this month we're focusing on literacy. This month we're focusing on numeracy. This month we're focusing on ELL. Um, ELL uh, uh, instruction when really, again, that one slide where, where I, I hinted at the fact that this is about taking the best of what we do and putting it all together to support every child. And you can do that within the current um, fiscal infrastructure, um, but it, it does require school systems to be much more thoughtful about how they align their professional development, how they align their, um, their budget, and how they include um, the entire community in, in that process. All right, thank you, Virgil. Uh, well, I think we're uh, we're approaching our ending time, so I just want to um, make sure that there wasn't anything that uh, that we missed that folks wanted to mention. Um, I will say we uh, will try to get out. Virgil, you mentioned you had a resource uh, um, available for folks, and we'll try to get that to the attendees. I'll see if there's a way for us to do that. And, uh, and anything else you'd like for us to share with um, any of the panelists, uh, I'll see if I can um, figure out how to do that. Um, anybody have any last remarks? Oh, if this is Susan, I just say to build on what Virgil um, was just saying, in terms of the implementation costs, the professional development is so important for all of the educators um, in the system. and. Also, the community outreach. Um, it, it, that's part of bringing in your community, um, community leaders, parents, um, teachers, students, is just so critical um, in, in building this new system where everything is aligned around doing what's right for kids and really ensuring that every student is successful. So I just wanted to highlight those two pieces and, and appreciate the the questions, thanks. All right, well thanks so much to our presenters and thanks to all of you who uh, attended. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, the webinar will be archived on the CSG website and uh, we will, and you, can, you can also contact me if you, uh, if you have any questions and I can maybe put you in touch with the speakers, uh, but we'll try to get any resources that they have to share uh, out to you. So thanks again to all of, all of you, appreciate it, this is a, this is a great, uh, great webinar. Thanks so much.